A native of Jakarta, Indonesia, Martin Kasuma is an award-winning pianist praised for his heartfelt flexibility and harmonic sensitivity, and clearly articulated playing of the highest order. Martin made his debut as a soloist with the Texas State Symphony Orchestra after winning the school's concerto competition. Since then, he has performed with the Central Texas Philharmonic, the Round Rock Symphony, the University of Texas University Orchestra, the National Symphony Orchestra of Indonesia, and more. Additionally, he has been invited to perform at prestigious venues and festivals, including the Val Recital Hall of the Carnegie Hall, Vinaroya Hall in Seattle, Trianon Theater in San Jose, Texas State International Piano Festival in San Marcos, Piano at Peabody at the Peabody Conservatory of the Johns Hopkins University, and the St. Giacomo Music Festival in Bologna. Martin has won multiple first and grand prizes in piano competitions, such as the Dickinson Piano Competition, Piano House International Piano Competition, New York International Music Concourse, and the ASEAN International Concerto Competition. Martin's debut album, Detours, was released in 2021 by the Centaur Records and is available internationally to purchase and stream. A graduate of Texas State University, classes of Washington Garcia and Jason Kwok, Martin continued to study at the University of Texas at Austin, where he graduated with his Master and Doctor of Musical Arts degrees in piano performance with Anton Nell. 
Martin is now a student of James Anak Nosen and Lee Wang in the Artist Diploma Program at the Glenn Gould School of the Royal Conservatory of Music. Coming to you from House of Piano Jakarta, my name is Irene Efren and I'm the community manager here. We're extremely lucky to have Dr. Martin Kasuma for this Steinway Enrichment Session. He will be presenting on how the instrument supports artistic exploration with examples from Baroque to contemporary. Before we get to his presentation, let's take some time to get to know Martin a little bit better. Hi Martin, how are you doing? Oh, great, thank you Irene, how are you? Doing okay, doing okay. I'm very happy that you're here with us in Indonesia for this whole month. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm always excited to be here. Uh, I haven't been back since COVID and it's definitely such a great experience to be back in Indonesia. It's good to hear. Um, I'm always very curious to, to know how pianists have their first like exposure to piano. Oh, that. Okay, so a little bit about myself. Uh, my father used to be a teacher for jazz piano and a little bit of classical piano. He doesn't really teach anymore. Well, he doesn't teach anymore. But then he used to accompany in church services as well. So um, I guess that's um, why I started music because my parents forced me to learn the piano in the beginning. Uh, I didn't like it at first. But then eventually I started to think you know, it's not that bad. I actually quite enjoy it. Um, Good to hear. <laughs> I got to be, when I got to be at a decent level, I started to enjoy it even more. And then I just felt like the better I got, the more I liked to play the piano. Was there a specific point of time that you decided, okay, I like it and this is what I want to do? Uh, I guess it's not really a specific time that I thought I liked it. It was more of a specific time that really sparked um, the electricity in me. It was when um, I saw a friend of mine playing the piano very well. I believe she played the revolutionary etude after only learning the piano for one or two years. And she was the same age with me, but then at that level, at that age, I was still playing Czerny not well. And then it became some kind of like a competition. And then I really, I didn't realize it, but then I really liked the competition. And then because of that, I started to practice so much and I started to fall in love with it during the process. I see. So that was when you were still in Jakarta? Yes, this was when I was about 10 years old. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. And then throughout that process, then you decided um, when you were like 17 or 18 to go to school in the States. Right, right. Uh, it was a little bit earlier than that. Um, I, I think when I was about 14, I already knew that I wanted to do piano or at least music in general because at that time I was also practicing violin and cello because oh, wow. those were fun and playing, in, you. playing in chamber music was really fun. And you don't really get that experience so much when you play the piano, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So what school did you go to and why did you choose that school? Okay, so <laughs> um, when I applied to undergraduate, I knew that I wasn't good at all. So I applied to so many competitions in Indonesia. I never won any single competition in Indonesia. I always lost or the biggest I won was the, what, what was it, like the fifth prize. Okay. And so I thought, okay, I'm not that good. I'm going to apply to a small school that I know that I would get in for sure. So that was Texas State University. And although it was a small school, I really clicked with the professors. The first one was Professor Washington Garcia. And then the second one was Jason Kwok. And then because I worked so well with them and then I also practiced a lot, I got so many exposures and everything. I ended up being a much better pianist after going to school there. And did you continue your master's there? Oh, uh, for master's, I actually went to a school that's a little bit nearby, about 30 minutes away. Uh, it's a bigger school. It's called the University 
University of Texas at Austin, and I stayed there for both my master's and doctorate. How long was that in total? Uh, the master's was about two years, and then the time it took for me to finish the coursework for doctorate was about two years or two years and a half, but then the paper was what took a longer time. So maybe a total about six years for okay. both master's and doctorate. So with your undergraduate degree, total about 10 years in Texas? Yeah, um, it's a little complicated because the last year of my um, doctorate program, I was actually doing it at the same time with uh, the artist diploma in uh, Canada. Okay, okay. So how did you make that decision to move to Canada? So here's the thing. I was studying with a very popular pianist, Anton Nell, at the UT Austin, and he's good friends with the professor at Glen Gould School, uh, James Agnesen. And then Anton told me, you know, maybe you should apply to this school. It's, it's a very good school, Glen Gould School of the Royal Conservatory of Music. And then I told him, yeah, that's impossible. I'm not going to get in. But just for fun, I'll apply. And then I didn't actually plan to go in there. But then I got full scholarship and I felt bad to reject it. So I, that's why I so went. It's, so it's better not to plan or it's better to plan? <laughs> Sometimes it's better to just go with the flow, you know? <laughs> but for sure, if you get full scholarship, don't reject it. <laughs> yeah, right? I mean, full scholarship at a very prestigious school. It's, now it's one of the best schools not just in Canada, but then also in North America. Uh, and then I am very happy to be studying with Jim and also with Lee, because they're both really amazing teachers who work so much on my technique. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, you've got these experiences learning piano in Indonesia and then US and Canada. What are some of the differences in terms of like teaching culture or teaching and learning culture? Mm. So the difference in the teaching and learning culture, I would say that it's, well, it's, there's some similarities. So they're both very competitive. I know that in Jakarta, it's, may, it's maybe not so competitive in the environment wise, but then I know that in Surabaya, it's very competitive, right? And then that's how I feel with the environment in Canada. Everyone's trying to get their best students to compete in competitions and then in competitions you'll get to see so many teachers um, trying to get their students to win and also to get their some kind of prestige to themselves which is also good um, you kind of need a healthy competition right um, let's see uh, do you enjoy it the competition mm -hmm. I feel like I didn't enjoy it as much. I don't actually recommend many of my but students. But you won a lot. Yeah, true. <laughs> um, I think it's fun if you like it. But then I know that I've, I've had students whom I thought that were really good, but then they didn't like doing competitions. So I thought, you know, it's just case by case mm -hmm. to the people. And then I honestly, I didn't really like uh, the process of competition. But then I think I forced myself to compete in at least one or two competitions mm -hmm. a year and just to keep in touch with the com competition nature of piano. Right, right. Okay, um, to close up this interview session, what are some of your dreams and hopes for the future? Wow. Um, so I do want to apply to more competitions. Uh, Right now, I'm still below 30 years old, and I feel like I could still apply to the big competitions. And then maybe even if I don't get to win, that's okay. Just to get to experience mm -hmm. how it is being in an uh, environment where everything is high stake. Mm -hmm. Maybe after one, I will retire. Maybe. We'll see. Um, also, I do enjoy teaching. Um, I do want to teach um, a little bit. Mm -hmm. And then I also want to work on some arranging compositions and not just performing, I guess, mm -hmm. but I want to be able to re reach out to other kinds of um, 
media and music. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you very much, Martin. Thank you, Irene.
Hello, everyone. I'm delighted to share with you this Steinway enrichment session today. In this presentation, we will be discussing about how the instrument supports artistic exploration with some musical explorations or examples from different periods. Since this topic is quite broad and would take a long time to cover, I have decided to only focus on three main aspects in a piano that supports artistic exploration. Sustain, dynamic contrast, and sensitivity. So let's talk about the sustain. First of all, piano is a percussive instrument in the way that once you press a note, it's, there's no way to make it go even louder or to change the sound. So the sound will decay until you stop it or until you let it disappear. Thanks to the technological advances, all pianos nowadays should be able to sustain a note for a very long time. Let's say about 20 to 30 seconds, and if you have an even bigger piano, then it could sustain for even longer than that. So the question is, it's not really about the quantity of the sustain, about how long it sustains, but it's more of the quality. Is the sustain um, or is the decay gradual from loud to soft slowly, or is it actually um, loud for the first few seconds and then suddenly really soft. So the sad reality is that when you have a smaller piano or an upright piano or even a piano that's not excellent, sometimes the second is what's happening. So once you press a note, um, after two or three seconds, it just becomes very quiet and as a result, it's very hard to keep listening to that note, especially when you have other voices going on, especially in Baroque music, like in Bach. So I'm very lucky that the piano in front of me is an excellent piano. Although it is a small piano, whenever I press a note, the decay is extremely gradual. So when we play a slow piece, we often encounter notes that are held for quite some time. And during that time, we need to keep listening to the note and make sure that we place the next note correctly. The longer the note is, the softer we would need to play the next note. For example, in the opening of Bach's Italian Concerto second movement, the right hand plays a long melody with some sustained notes, but then we need to make sure that after the sustained note, um, we play the following note even softer. So let me play it a little bit. So this is the right hand opening. And then if we, add an, if we decide to play the note that follows the sustained note quite loud, it would kind of sound like this. It's the same note. Um, to practice this, let's play a note in the middle register. Keep listening to it. And then now let's try to play the note next to it and try to match the volume. You could also play around with it. You could play a note and not wait so long. And then if you don't wait so long, then you would need to play the next note a little bit louder. And you could even wait a little bit longer, but then um, it's going to be even harder the longer you wait. So uh, let's get it straight though. Um, all pianos should be able to do this. It's just a matter of how easy it is facilitating your job. Um, so I remember uh, my teacher from UT Austin, my pedagogy professor, 
Professor Sophia Gomson. She always tells us to practice this exercise, the one where you play a note and then play a different note but follow the decay of it. Um, she always says it's a good practice for you, for piano teachers, and also for the students. Um, it is an easy exercise to do, but then it does a lot to your playing. And to me, it's kind of the bread and butter of playing the piano because, as I said before, the piano is a percussion instrument and there is no way that we could actually do crescendo. And by listening this intently, uh, we could actually make a long line, which is something that's not the most natural thing to do on the piano. So I will play for you the entire second movement of Bach's Italian Concerto.
Okay, so to recap about the previous section, all pianos should be able to sustain a note for a long time, and it should be possible to make a beautiful line out of any pianos. But the difference is how easy is it to sustain a beautiful line? How easy is it to listen to a voice while you also have other voices going on? So the exercise that we did earlier, the purpose was uh, to make sure that we keep listening until the end of that note and to match that volume with the new note so that it sounds like one big line. And then if we did not do that, it would sound like we're cutting the line into two different lines. So let's move on to the second chapter, dynamic contrast. The term piano comes from the instrument pianoforte, which translates to soft and loud. And the pianoforte is named that way because it is able to produce a loud sound and also a soft sound, as opposed to a harpsichord, which doesn't have that contrast. Um, well, this was several years ago, and since then, pianos have undergone through many modifications, and modern pianos nowadays are able to play with really big contrasts. You could expect all pianos, even upright pianos or even digital pianos, to be able to play really soft to really loud. But again, the question is, how easy is it to use all that range that is available? Is it easy to play loud? Is it easy to play soft? And is it easy to change between the dynamics between soft to loud or the other way around? So let me tell you my own personal experience. So I grew up with this piano that is always really bright and always really loud. It was always really easy to play something loud, for example, um, romantic pieces by Liszt or even contemporary pieces, but then it would always be really hard for me to play something soft, especially pieces by Mozart or Chopin Nocturne. Because I practiced on it for so long, eventually I was able to produce a nice soft sound on that piano, and my friends would always compliment me for being able to play really soft without an una corda whenever I'm given a really nice piano. But then the downside of that is that now whenever I play the piano, especially in soft sections, I'm actually tensing up a little bit. And tracing back, I think it's because of that piano that I practiced so much on. And I'll tell you what, I've been trying to fix my technique for so many years, and even now, I could still feel that it's tense. Changing someone's technique is a very hard process and painful process, not just for the students, but also for the teachers. Um, I still remember how uh, my teacher now, Jim Nagnuson, he always makes me do all sorts of different attitudes, all sorts of weird movements that he wants me to do with my wrist in order for me to change my technique. And then every time I tense up, he would always yell at me, Martin, stop tensing up, relax. Or he would just touch my shoulder to make sure that I'm not tense. So I'll tell you what, if you have a teacher that tells you to fix your technique every week or very often, just know that he or she is a good teacher and you should appreciate that. Because a lot of teachers would sometimes not really want to handle uh, the changing of the technique because it is a painful journey. And then I have also experienced the opposite. One time I gave a recital in a very beautiful hall in Texas with mostly loud pieces except for a Mozart sonata. So the Mozart sonata sounded really beautiful on that piano and in that hall because it is naturally a soft piano. But then it was very hard for me to produce a loud sound. Uh, my friends from the audience kept telling me that 
they saw me trying so hard to make a loud sound, but then there was never any loud sound that came out out of that box. So I, I'm pretty sure that if I had to play on that piano for a little bit longer, I might have even developed tendonitis. So that is kind of the danger of having a piano that's not well balanced. So you would want a piano that can do really soft and really loud with ease. So uh, going back to the discussion, when you have a piano that does um, both spectrums with ease, it would really open up your interest in all sorts of music. So for example, if your piano sounds good soft, then uh, whenever you play something soft like a Chopin Nocturne or a Mozart Sonata, uh, then it would sound better, so you would like it more. And also, um, when your piano sounds good loud and it doesn't sound harsh at all, uh, you might even start to appreciate um, call, uh, you might even start to appreciate modern music and contemporary music, especially those with huge changes in dynamics. So I will now play the first movement of Ginastera's Piano Sonata Number no. 1.
This year, House of Piano Jakarta is so happy to bring to you this exciting program, Indonesia Piano Teachers Club. The vision of this club is a community of dedicated, supportive, and successful piano teachers. Our mission is one, to promote the advancement of piano pedagogy in Indonesia, two, to facilitate the careers of Indonesian piano teachers, and three, to encourage the spirit of collaboration among piano teachers in Indonesia. The membership has a limited slot, so House of Piano may maximize benefits for members and manage the club more effectively. Membership fee is absolutely free for 2023. Membership requirement, actively teaching piano, whether in private studio, academy, or institution. Benefit for Indonesian Piano Teacher Club members, piano pedagogy seminars, online or on-site, with highly acclaimed international pedagogues, workshops to boost piano teachers' careers, Steinway concert series, live performances, consultation sessions for concert management, newsletter, rent House of Piano Recital Hall or Steinway Recital Hall for teachers or students, rent House of Piano Practice Room or Steinway Practice Room for teachers or students, Teachers may accumulate reward points, which can be exchanged with various benefits up to a piano from House of Piano, and many more enrichment opportunities. How do you join this club? 1. Complete the membership data and information form. 2. Follow IPTC Instagram or TikTok account, or both. 3. Join IPTC WhatsApp group. What are some of our upcoming events? March, Addressing Neck and Shoulder Pain for Pianists with Dr. Sophia Hagel, Sports Medicine Specialist. May, Piano Pedagogy Residency with Dr. Cecilia Yuda, Steinway Top Teacher. July, Financial Freedom for Piano Teachers Workshop. A community of dedicated, supportive, and successful piano teachers. That's our vision. The Japanese philosopher and writer Ryunosuke Satoro wrote that individually we are one drop. Together, we are an ocean. We invite you to grow together with us. Thank you. Okay, so now let me explain to you why I chose the previous piece in Astera's Piano Sonata Number no. 1, First Movement. So, usually contemporary pieces have a lot of dynamic ranges, and oftentimes you're required to change between dynamics from soft to loud or from loud to soft in a very short time. And when your piano accommodates those changes, it becomes so easy for us to play those changes and also to be able to play them with ease so that we don't have unnecessarily um, tensions. And then with contemporary pieces as well, they often give you a lot of flexibility with your dynamics. So when you're given a piece like that where you could just be free and also with a piano that accommodates almost everything you want, then you're basically given a canvas of so many different options and you could just choose what you want to do and it really brings out your creativity. So now let's move on to the last point, the sensitivity. So essentially, the more sensitive your piano is to your input, the easier it is for you to play and to be creative. Let me explain by using parts of Bach's Italian concerto, first movement, as an example. So let me start by playing the beginning of the first movement of um, Bach's Italian Concerto. And then that theme or subject is repeated almost quite exactly, but this time in C major, which is the dominant of the key F major. Of course, it is entirely possible to play the second one, which is in C major, a little bit louder. Um, 
But then also, there are some other things that we could do to this section without changing the dynamics. So I still remember my pedagogy professor, Professor Sophia Gomson, explaining to her students that they should always try to play a passage without any dynamics and without any pedals. So the purpose of that is to bring out a whole different dimension to your playing. And that um, sometimes it's just subtle changes, for example, color changes, but then those subtle changes are what really makes someone's playing special. So going back to the Bach example, let's think of the first um, theme as being uh, maybe a brown color. And then let's think of the second one as being a lighter color, maybe a light blue. And this time, let's play it without changing the dynamics. So. so when we put those together, maybe we'll have something like this. And then there are so many ways of um, making differences, especially when you have a good piano. So when you have a sensitive piano, it is very easy to change the colors and to do many different things. And it's basically just like what I mentioned earlier. Imagine if you're painting and then suddenly, instead of having only two different colors or three different colors, now you have 10 different colors and you get to choose and mix what you want to do with them. So now let's take a look at the other example. This is the second page of the first movement of the Italian concerto. Let me start by playing this passage first. Okay, so if you know a lot about Baroque music, or if you know this piece well, you might say, okay, the beginning of what I just played sounds like a big orchestra, but then what comes next sounds like a solo instrument uh, playing while being accompanied by some strings instrument. So, um, of course, the second section might also be softer, but then what's written in the score is that the melody needs to be forte. So if you have a good piano, you should be able to think of a different instrument, maybe an oboe, and then somehow the sound that comes out of it would sound different than the sound that you had before. Um, so of course, it is entirely possible to play this kind of things or to show these differences with any pianos, even electric keyboards. But then it is more of the question of how easy is it? And would you be able to make the changes without doing much physically? And would you be able to make the changes just by thinking of making the changes? So, actually, uh, when your piano is sensitive, you start to hear a lot of different things. And when you're practicing, suddenly you start to think of different possibilities. Just actually, when I was playing this, I suddenly thought of, okay, so the, when the second theme appears, it almost sounds like it could be a very soloistic oboe. Uh, or it could also be something more like a march. So let me play you the first one, which is more of like a soloistic oboe. And 
And the second one is, let's think of it as making it more like a march. So those are very subtle changes, but then I didn't really change the dynamics or make one louder or softer. I think it's sometimes, especially in playing Bach, um, you don't always get to change the dynamics much. There are several ways of playing Bach. Uh, some people might say, well, Bach wrote this pieces for a harpsichord, so we should probably not play with a lot of dynamics. But then also, some people also think that, well, what we have in front of us is a piano. And you know Bach was a genius, so anything that he composed would sound good in any style, even jazz or metal or rock music. So how about we just use what we have um, and create a big dynamic differences. So I personally feel that those two extremes are a little too extreme. And I believe that I'm somewhere in the middle. So I agree with um, some changes to dynamics. But then I also know that there are some places where we cannot change the dynamics or we cannot rely on it too much. And when in those places, I think it's the time to use the different colors as our weapon. Now, let's take a look at the other example. This one is from Beethoven's Tempest Sonata, first movement. And this is the beginning of the development section. So let me play um, this section for you. So on. So let's ask this question. Um, it sounded like in the beginning it sounded quite hopeful, but then towards the end, all hopes are crushed. So the question is do we know that there is no hope? Do we know that when we see a glimmer of hope, it's not real? And we know that there is no hope that comes from it. Or do we not know that there is no hope? Do we think that, oh, there is really a hope, so maybe something positive might come out? So let me play these two different versions. So the first one is the person knowing that there is no hope at all. And when they see a light, they know that they might get a little hopeful but they know not to put their hope too much. Let me demonstrate the second one where the person doesn't know that there is no hope at all at the end. So when the person sees the glimmer of light, the person becomes very hopeful, but then tragically crushed at the end.
So those two different stories are some of um, the possible interpretations. And the thing is, the more sensitive your piano is, the easier it is for you to think of different interpretations. And yeah, um, when you think of different interpretations, some kind of dynamic changes is necessary. But I think that's really the difference of dynamic contrast and also the sensitivity. Because uh, the sensitivity is more like taking a magnifying glass into the dynamic contrast and see um, how different we could make things sound without making it sound different. Okay, so to um, conclude about this topic, I'll be playing for you the entire first movement of Beethoven's Tempest Sonata.
I would like to thank House of Piano in Jakarta and also the Steinway and Sons Indonesia for inviting me for this Steinway enrichment session and also for supplying me with such a beautiful piano. Aside from it looking really beautiful, it also sounds great. Um, from what I mentioned earlier, uh, the sustained rate in this piano is amazing because uh, it might look like it's a small piano, but then the sustain of it, when you press a note, the rate of decay is very gradual, which doesn't happen often in smaller pianos like this. But this is quite a common thing in Steinway & Sons pianos. And then I didn't get to mention this earlier, but then the voicing of this piano is also very good. It's especially easy to play pieces like Bach on this piano because I could just think of the voice that I wanted to highlight and the piano did its job so easily for me. It was like um, everyone could drive from Jakarta to Bandung, but then if you have a cheaper car, it might not be as smooth of a ride. And if you have a really nice car, it would be really smooth, just like how I felt when, when I was playing on this piano. Thank you to everyone, and thank you to everyone watching um, this seminar, and I hope all of you have a great evening. That was Dr. Martin Kasuma with his amazing presentation and wonderful music playing. I know I certainly enjoyed the session and I hope you did too. Don't forget to subscribe to House of Piano YouTube channel and tune in to all of our videos. Thank you.